Hey everybody, I am on my next job here. I'm in a kitchen in Maple Grove. And what was hot in 1980 is just not cutting it anymore. We've got this 1980s kitchen with built-in toasters, brick arch over the stove, and it just screams 1980s, and especially this dark oak kitchen cabinets. We wanna spruce up this kitchen so the homeowner can get it on the market and get this thing sold. So first thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna come in and take these absolutely beat up and worn out cabinets. As you can see here, they're missing finish. There's water damage and everything, but they're solid oak. We can bring solid oak back to life. I'm just gonna clean them up, sand them down, give them some uh, grain filler, prime them, top coat them. They're gonna look absolutely fantastic. Then when I'm done, the homeowner is going to put on some nice new butcher block countertops, a new backsplash, and this is going to be transformed from a 1980s kitchens to a modern masterpiece. It's going to look absolutely great when it's done, I think. So let's get to work and see how it turns out. The first thing I like to do when I walk into a job is to shop vac all of the floors, really clean up the floors really good. And if there's anything really dirty about them, I'll get down and I'll wash them up real quick just to make sure that my tape really sticks around that corner round at the bottom. Next, I bust out my inch and a half to two inch delicate surface tape. This is frog tape. It's their yellow delicate surface. And if you've seen our tape comparison video, you can learn a lot more about this tape, but this is a tape specifically made for floors. What's nice about it is it has a 30 day release. It won't stick to the floor and leave all that kind of gummy tape glue behind. If you've ever left a tape on too long and tried to pull it up, you've seen where it rips and leaves stuff behind. And it's just an absolute mess when you go to pull it up. This delicate surface tape won't do that. It has a 30 day clean release. And the other thing is too, on older floors like this, as you can see, sometimes the finish is a little bit loose. And if you have a tape that's too adhesive, you can actually pull the tape up and strip off that top clear coat right off the floor, creating a whole nother project for yourself when you're done. So I don't use anything else on floors unless there's a specific reason. Maybe uh, I've got a tile floor or something like that and it's not sticking well. Maybe I'll use green frog tape in certain spots, but most of the time I'm gonna be using my frog tape delicate surface so that I don't damage the floor and so that my tape pulls clean when the project is all completed. As you can see, I've got a Warner five-in-one tool down there. Actually, that's like a 16-in-one. It does all the things. I don't know what all 16 of the uses of that five-in-one tool are. I see, I call it a five-in-one but technically it's got things like a bottle opener and nail puller and everything. But what's cool about this tool is that five in one is a single piece stainless steel. That means the handle all the way down to the tip, it's all one piece, which one, it looks cool. Two, it feels good in the hand and everything. But what's really nice about it is if you're using it for doing things like patching little holes on your wall, you get paint on it, anything like that, you can literally throw this thing like in your dishwasher if you really wanted to. It cleans up really nice. You don't have those rubber handles and everything that hold paint, look filthy after a while. It's just a really cool, nice tool. So I go around, I just take my time. It can take a lot of little pieces of tape. You wanna make sure to get perfect around those edges, in the corners and going around door openings, stuff like that. Sometimes it takes three, four, five, six little pieces in there. And another thing is getting under the cabinets there. You can't roll out huge strips at a time. You just kind of got to take anywhere from one foot to three foot pieces. You can see I even grabbed an extra little piece because I saw a little gap. Or maybe the uh, quarter round kind of bows up off the floor. So then I'll take another little piece and I'll tuck it under there so that you don't see paint going under that quarter round piece. Once I put the tape down, I go and I press it with my hand and then go back and run my five in one tool over that just to get a nice seal on that inside edge so that no paint can slip under that edge of the tape while I'm spraying. Next, I lay down three foot wide brown rosin paper. This just gives me a protective barrier in the kitchen and it's durable. It's better than putting plastic on the floor. And this stays down until the, it's the very last thing I pull out of a kitchen. So it makes it so I can walk around in my shoes. It keeps the floor clean when I'm spraying. 
And it's a drop cloth on the floor for when I'm done spraying the cabinets and I'm painting the walls. Or in here, we actually painted the ceiling too. So it was really nice. This, this was just prep for all of that. So when I put this down, the plan is that this paper stays down for the entire course of the job. You'll also see I got a, uh, a nice um, retractable knife down there. That's another uh, Warner tool. I like Warner, they just make high quality tools. So you'll see most of my mud knives, my five in ones, my razor blades and everything are all gonna be Warner brand, which you can find a link to down in the description below if you're looking at grabbing any five in one tools, any knives, any mud knives, stuff like that. Once all the floors are covered, I didn't really have to worry about the countertops. Oftentimes that would be next, but on this job, they're ripping the countertops out as soon as I'm done painting. So I kind of got to use them as a workbench, I guess. So I got to jump right on to the door removal. And as you can see here, I remove the hinges and I label each door and I write a number with a marker inside where the hinge covered on the door. And then I cover it with a piece of tape. And then on a piece of tape, I write the corresponding number that I just wrote and put it inside the cabinet. So you can see that says number four and I probably wrote a number four on that cabinet door. Numbering your doors and where they came from will save you hours of time when you're putting the project back together. You'll find a handful of doors that are so close or two doors that went side by side and we accidentally flip one around and everything. And when they're so close and just slightly off, nothing goes together right. You'll end up fighting the project for extra hours. I've done this and I've lived with the regret of having a miserable day putting cabinet doors back together. A job that should take two hours has taken me probably upwards of six plus hours when I didn't label doors. So I will not be making that mistake again. And now I label everything. Also, when I take off a hinge, I don't put them in a bucket. I put the hinges inside the cabinet where it came from with the screws and all of these cabinets get prepped off with plastic. So it's a safe place to put them so you don't lose anything and you end up putting the same hinge back on the same door. It's just a really simple way. You don't have to number and label the hinges then. Just put them exactly where they came from and I'll lay them in order inside the cabinet and it saves me a lot of headache again at the end of a job. Here the Lazy Susan actually gave me a little bit of a hassle. Every kitchen's a little bit different and you gotta get creative with how you prep, how you spray and everything like that. Every kitchen, there's, there's usually a couple cupboards that are just hard to prep. And you can see here, I'm just kinda looking at going, huh, a 40 year old Lazy Susan, how do I wanna tackle this? So I just unscrewed the door from the shelves. Thankfully, this one was quite simple, but I'll tell you, some of them, some of them are weird, don't make sense, and they're hard to get on and off. Occasionally, I will paint a door in place in the kitchen. I've done kitchens entirely where all the doors are in place, and there's a reason for that whenever I do it. But usually, if I leave a door in, it's because it's glued in, a garbage door, a spice rack door, and taking it out just isn't practical. So I'll spray it in place, and then I'll go back and I'll brush and roll the back sides of it after I'm done. The uh, faces of the drawers just unscrewed from the fronts of the drawers. And you see the label I just did there. I added an arrow pointing up. You always want to label which way is up on your drawer faces if you can take your drawer faces off. Sometimes the drawer faces don't come off and you just have to pull the whole box out and prep it all off. And thankfully I didn't have to do that here, so that saves me a lot of time. See, 15, and I point it up there. That lets me know exactly how to put the door back on when it's all said and done. And next is the sand before I do the grain filler. So the doors are all nice and clean and degreased and now I just go through them and give them a good hard scuff sand with a medium grit sanding sponge. Medium grit usually means about 120 on the low end, maybe up to 180 grit. And that's what I'm gonna do. You know, sometimes you find little pieces of tape from people putting things on the back sides of their doors recipes, notes, whatever. So I'm hunting for things like that. I'm hunting for those little uh, bumpers, stuff like that, making sure to scrape them all off. And I wanna be really thorough. This is a really important step. You wanna break down that surface and give yourself more surface area so that your primer has more surface to bond to when you spray that on. And this is also where I'm checking, is there any doors that are really greasy or anything that needs to be addressed more than just a hand sand. 
Usually those doors are the ones that are right around a stove. You know, just that moisture and cooking grease and everything like that. There's usually a couple doors right above or around a stove that get really awful. Thankfully in this job, the stove was in a brick nook in the kitchen and there wasn't any of those really greasy, awful doors to deal with. So I liked that. That was good, good for me. But sanding is one of the most repetitive, boring parts of painting kitchen cabinets. And sanding happens a lot. There is hours and hours of sanding when you're doing kitchen cabinet painting. You sand before you do the grain filler. You sand after the grain filler. You sand after the primer. You sand after the first coat. And it's just lots and lots of sanding. And of all the steps, I'm going to admit to you that sanding is my least favorite step of the entire kitchen cabinet painting process. Next, I'm getting ready and preparing the grain filler. If you've seen uh, any of my grain filler videos, you probably know how this goes, but I use a little bit of drywall plus three and water and mix that up until it's got the consistency of kind of a really thick paint. I don't want it to feel like drywall. So I add water and stir that up, try to get it really nice and smooth and make it so it's, like I said, a nice thick paint. You can see it drips off a little bit. That's pretty good. So next I'm gonna lay down my doors, vacuum them off, and start applying the grain filler. So what I like to do to apply my grain filler is use a couple of knives, and here you'll see a couple more of my Warner stainless steel knives, which I love, and then I scrape it off with a nice big flat knife. And what that does is it gets the excess off so that sanding is easier later and it forces it down into the grain so that you really get it filled up nice. Here I go around the edges with a paintbrush and I just kind of paint it on. And that paintbrush, you just work it back and forth into all the nooks and crannies and really try to fill that grain up. But then another tip, when you put on the grain filler, if you let the grain filler dry and you have gobs in your corners and in your edges, it's very hard to sand it out. It's an absolute pain in the butt and it's miserable and it will double, if not triple, your sanding time. So I actually go in with my brush and try to clean it out of the corners after I apply it, and I'll go in with a little one-inch knife and scrape out the little edges. It's much easier to get out when it's wet than it is when it's dry. If you just brush it all on and leave it all over sloppy, like if I left it right like this, it would be a nightmare to sand. So. This makes my sanding drastically easier and saves me a lot of time in later steps. And it does force that grain filler down into the grain better so that I get a better looking finish when the project is all said and done. So what the grain filler does is if you've ever painted oak or seen painted oak, what can happen is all of that deep graining will show up as little holes in your finish. And those holes, because let's say you painted white, now contrast with a shadow and they just stand out like a sore thumb. They look like little black holes all over in your nice white cabinet finish. So by filling the grain, we fill all those and make it for a much smoother finish without all those little grain divots all over in the final coat. When oak is painted, you still get kind of a waviness from the grain, but the waviness, it's hard to explain, but it's completely acceptable on something you deal with. There are methods of getting rid of that, but it's it's a lot of work and it requires a lot of buildup of paint and everything. And I would say most all people are very happy with just filling the grain. It really gets you an incredible finish when, when the project's all said and done. This step when you're doing oak cabinets is probably the biggest and longest step, applying the grain filler and sanding the grain filler. That's usually when I start to have a little bit of wear down. The second day sanding out grain filler for hours upon hours. It can get old and it gets very tedious, but it is worth doing and it takes that finish from an amateur up to a professional looking finish. Also, you may be tempted to go and buy grain filler at the store or something. But let me tell you, I've been doing this for 20 years. And nothing works better than plus three drywall mud mixed with a little bit of water 
It sands incredibly easy when it's done. It does not come out of the grain. I get asked if that happens. It does not. It holds up really well. I've got kitchens that had this method done nearly 20 years ago, and they're still holding up beautifully. If you want to learn more about how I make my grain filler and apply my grain filler and just more about the grain filler, I have multiple videos on this channel that you can check out, and I'll make sure to leave a link in the description below. Now that all of the grain filler has been applied and allowed to dry, you can see all of the grain filler really on the tops of the cabinets. When it's wet, it's hard to see them. And now I just go through with a fine grit sanding sponge, usually about 180 grit, and sand that all off lightly. I don't over sand at this point. I don't wanna sand the grain filler out. I just wanna sand everything smooth and leave behind all of the grain filler that's in the grain. If you push too hard, it's very easy to start taking the grain filler out of the grain and thus eliminating the work that you've already done. It's a very dusty, messy step. And you can see I don't do the backsides of doors. I've just never felt the need to do that. I always offer it as an option to my clients and they always say no. So I don't remember the last time I actually put grain filler in the backsides of doors. It's good to have a fresh sanding sponge with nice sharp edges so that you can get in all the little corners and everything really good on the cabinet doors. If your edges start getting ripped up, let's say you've done seven, eight, nine, ten 10 doors and the edges get a little ripped up, grab a new sponge. It's worth it for the nice sharp edge. I get asked all the time in the comments on YouTube if I sand before I prime, if I sand after primer, if I sand in between coats. The answer is yes, 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 yes. I sand anywhere from like five to six different times on the average cabinet job. I use medium grit before the grain filler and then I switch to a fine grit the rest of the way until I'm sanding in between top coats. Then I switch to an extra fine grit. By fine grit, I mean that 180 to 220. By extra fine, I'm usually you know 220 to 320 in that range. They're all kind of different, but that's kind of that extra fine range where medium grit, I consider about 120. Here you see that after I sand, I check all my corners and it's really hard to get in those corners with a sanding sponge. So I have an angled one inch Warner knife there and I go in and I have to scrape out those corners if I didn't get it out good enough while it was still wet. If you leave too much in those corners, that's what I was referring to that it will cost you a lot of extra time at this step. It's far easier to get out when it's wet but even if you do a good job, you still have to clean the corners a little bit and spend a little bit of extra time getting those corners really nice so that when you go to paint it, it looks absolutely fantastic. You've probably heard me say in lots of my videos before, but painting kitchen cabinets like this is 90% prep, 10% painting. It's just lots and lots of prep work. It's prepping off the floors, the countertops, it's sanding, it's vacuuming, it's caulking, it's grain filling. Spraying is a very short step and to be honest, spraying is probably no more than six hours on a job like this, maybe nine tops of a 40 to 50 hour job. So more like 20%, but you get the idea. Now that all the doors have been sanded and they're ready to go, it's time to hit the box frames and give them a nice quick sand. And here you can really see what's left behind of that grain filler after I give it a good sand and just how much of the grain filler I leave behind. I just get everything nice and smooth and I want that grain filled like that. All the white left behind is areas that will look smoother and flatter and not have little holes in the finish. You can see how important this step is when you just look at those box frames right here. This edge right here of the cabinets really is another great example of how well that grain filler goes in and it shows you just what's really being filled when you apply that grain filler. So if you have old cabinets and you really want a good looking finish, you know, you got to sand. People always ask me is what about, you know, is there a way to paint cabinets without sanding? Do I have to use grain filler? You don't have to do anything, but if you want it to look really professional, last a long time, you got to sand it and you got to fill the grain. Now that the sanding is all done, it's time to vacuum. This is another thing I do a lot on a job. You got to keep a dust free environment in order to get a dust-free finish. The next step in painting kitchen cabinets is to bag off all of the insides of the cabinets, if you're not painting them. 
I typically don't paint them. Most cabinets look fine on the inside and the inside's already pretty much maintenance free. So we don't usually apply paint. Occasionally we do if somebody wants that and that's fine and dandy. But I go around with my 3M hand masker and I use a flake resistant six foot plastic roll and frog tape. Frog tape is great because uh, the green frog tape here, it's got great adhesion and yet it has great release. It doesn't allow bleed through. And the 3M uh, flake resistant plastic is great because you can get primer on it. And then when you spray your first round top coat, it, the primer won't flake off and get in your top coat. And then when you spray your second coat of top coat, same thing, it won't get off into your top coat. Here, these shelves were like uh, nailed, glued in place. So you, you gotta get creative sometimes when you're prepping the insides of cabinets because they're all different. And sometimes they don't allow you to get into the cabinets very well. So I will go and if I can, I'll pull the shelves out and get it prepped off really nice and perfect. And sometimes I have to tape it to the edges of the wood and go back in with the paintbrush and clean that up when I'm done, just what it is. Next is prepping off the dishwasher. I open up the dishwasher so that I can get the tape really deep into the dishwasher so that no paint's gonna slip in there. And it's really easy to just open up the door and run a strip of plastic around all the edges of the dishwasher door. Then go in and tuck the plastic around the tape and close the door and you've got it prepped really nice. Then you just have to go under around the bottom and kind of tuck that tape in there. Make sure that you have no parts of that dishwasher showing. You know, the rule of spraying is anything that shows will have paint on it when you're done. Kind of like walking into a job site in your normal clothes. You might say, well, I'm not gonna paint anything. It's okay, I'm just going to look at it. And before you know it, you have paint on yourself. It just happens, there's no way around it. Paint will jump out of the bucket and get on your clothes. Here, this Lazy Susan was actually a little bit tricky to prep. You just have to kind of come up with ways of bagging off the insides of the cabinets. And sometimes it works great. And sometimes it's a little tricky and a little messy. And you just kind of have to figure out a plan. Here, I tuck it around the, the, the turning part, the Lazy Susan part, and just kind of stuff tape and plastic in there until I feel like it holds well enough. If you're spraying, it has to hold well enough so that if you blast high pressure air at it, it will hold up against that air. So that can be a problem. If your prep isn't snug and tight and the tape isn't adhered really nice onto what you're trying to block off, when you spray it with your sprayer, if you're using an HVLP, that's a lot of air. And if you're using an airless, that's a lot of pressure. So it'll blow that plastic right off if you didn't prep it really good. Here I'm just kind of trying to figure out how I can get the tape in and how I get the plastic on until I feel like the Lazy Susan is nice and snug and tight and isn't gonna let any paint behind there. Now that the cabinets are just about prepped, I've got some brick in this kitchen that I need to prep. And you'll notice I switched to the orange frog tape. And the orange tape is actually their high adhesion tape. So I've noticed that normal tape can oftentimes just not stick well to things like brick, concrete, everything like that. And this high adhesion tape works wonderfully. And you'll see when the job is done, not one speck of paint got behind there. So that worked out really well and it came off perfectly, left no residue behind. The brick just turned out perfect. So that, that was great. It's nice to have a tape like this high adhesion tape that you can use in situations like this. Next, I'm running a little bit of frog tape along the wall. I wanted to just bag off that entire stove area. The one thing about brick is that it's so porous and rough. If you get even a speck of paint on it, even with a wire brush or anything, you're not gonna get it off and you're gonna have to scrub it so hard, you're gonna have a goofy looking spot on your brick anyway. So for me spraying, I feel the safest thing to do was to bag off this entire area. And there were only two little boxes inside there next to the stove. So I figured I could go back in with a brush later when I'm all done and paint those by hand with the DIY cabinet brush, which is a brush designed specifically for painting kitchen cabinets based on my 20 years of experience. And it's a very soft brush that leaves very little brush strokes behind. You can order it at DIYPaintingSupply.com. 
All right, I've been working on this kitchen for the last two days. I've got everything all prepped off and I'm just about ready to start spraying. I'm gonna be using Sherwin-Williams Premium Wall and Wood Primer on this job. What I like about this is it's a great bonding primer. It dries quick, but best of all, when you're doing oak cabinets, it really powders nice when you sand it. So you get that really nice smooth finish and just kind of helps with that oak graining a little bit too. It's an absolutely fantastic primer. And then we're gonna to be topping with the Emerald Urethane from Sherwin-Williams. And again, this is a fantastic looking product. We're using satin and we matched it to Benjamin Moore's White Dove, which is really close to Sherwin-Williams Dover White, but White Dove is a little bit more pure white. So I kind of like it a little bit better. And that's what the homeowner chose to go with here. So let's get set up and get started spraying. All right, so I'm pouring all 128 ounces of primer into my mixing bucket. And you can see I kind of maxed this bucket out. I should have gotten a little bit bigger bucket, but it worked. And now I am measuring out about 25, 26 ounces of water so that I can thin my paint down by 20%. I like to pour it into the bucket, stir it around just to get that extra paint out because this stuff is liquid gold. Don't want to leave any of it behind. And I have my stir stick, but I wanted to switch to my Warner paint stirrer. I don't know what you call them, but it's a paint stirrer. Put it in the drill and it mixes the paint paint mixer. There you go. It's a paint mixer. But this one's angled just right to create a nice, I'm going to call it a whirlwind, a tornado, something where it just pulls the paint down and it mixes it really nice without adding in a bunch of bubbles. So I really like this mixer from Warner. And now that the primer's ready, it's time to suit up. Now I'm setting up the Wagner Flexio 5000 and getting ready to spray. If you look at our channel, you'll see a few different uh, videos on how to dial in the Wagner Flexio 5000 and get it just right for spraying. The Flexio 5000 is actually my favorite DIY sprayer for doing kitchen cabinets. And there's a few reasons. One, is it's a turbine HVLP, which I think is great for spraying cabinets. It gives you a really nice fine atomization and gives you a really good finish. Two, what I like about this one is the turbine is actually separate from the gun. So a lot of the cheaper HVLP sprayers, the turbine will be right on the gun, which puts a lot of weight on your arm and shoulder. And on a big kitchen like this, your shoulder will be exhausted. So you get to put all that weight on the floor and just have the hose going to the gun, which is fantastic. This sprayer, in my opinion, sprays every bit as good as your $500 to $2,000 HVLP sprayers at roughly $200, give or take a little bit where you find it online. It's a fantastic sprayer that should last you multiple projects. And if anything does break, it's it's gonna be on that gun part, which you can buy replacement parts for. So I think it's great for people who, you know, might pull it out one time a year. If you're gonna be painting, you know, cabinets all day, every day, invest in the more expensive sprayer. I use this to show that yes, you can get a professional finish, not just a beautiful finish, one that people would be happy to pay money for. So you can absolutely do this yourself especially with a sprayer and save money. I like to suit up with a full paint suit, cover my hair and put on a mask, even though I am using a water-based low VOC paint. I believe that this primer is under 50 grams per liter of VOCs, which is very low. Like you barely notice this paint, but I spray it all day, every day. So I still do protect myself and I don't want to breathe in any latex particles, anything like that. So I always mask up and I like to do more than just a, you know, a simple 3M cotton mask just to protect myself. Here you'll see a little bit of my weird habit where I can't help it, but I will spray the bottom half, then I'll jump to the top and spray down. It's a habit. I don't know where it came from. Somebody mentioned in the comments one time that there's a scientific reason we do things like that. I don't remember what it was. I wish I could find that comment again. So if you know why I start at the bottom spraying something and then halfway up, I go to the top and spray from the top back to the middle, let me know because it makes no sense to me.
In all honesty, boxes are probably where you're most likely to get runs. Where horizontal piece of wood runs into a vertical piece of wood and you get a few different angles of your spray overlapping each other. That is the most common spot to get runs. So when you're done with an area, just look over those spots especially. Grab your uh, DIY painting cabinet brush and go back. And if you see a run forming, just brush it out real quick. It should settle in and lay down really nice. And remember too that those areas are covered by the cabinet doors. So if you do get a run, odds are you're barely ever gonna notice it and you are probably gonna be the only one who ever notices it. Next, I'm taking the doors in and I'm shooting the primer on the doors and you'll see these green little, I'm gonna call them painter's pyramids, little cones. I put those under my door to keep it off the paper. You can see how wet and sticky that would be. If I put my cabinets right on there, it'd be a mess. And those end up barely touching the cabinet door at all. So they don't cause any damage when you flip them over and do the other sides, even though I do wait for them to dry. These ones are actually from Warner. And what's cool about them is they have like a curve in them and they have two points. Most of them just have one point. And I didn't think anything of these when I first saw them. I was like, oh, a curved painter's pyramid with two points. I, I don't get it. But as soon as I started painting with them, it made sense why they did it. It just gives the door more points of contact. It was sturdier. And I was able to put a, like a wine rack, I think I was spraying here. And I was able to balance it in that little curved area and stuff, which hopefully you'll see coming up here just shortly. One major reason that I spray my doors flat like this horizontally is that I believe as a DIY painter, this is the perfect way to spray your doors. You're not gonna get runs when you're spraying flat. It gives you a lot more room for error and just allows you to really cake on that paint and give you a nice glass-like finish. It is gonna be faster if you spray them vertically and you have little hooks or something. You'll see a lot of professional painters will spray that way. That's something that takes practice so you don't get runs in your cabinet doors and it's a lot faster. But this way is a very foolproof way to apply your sprayed coats. All right, well, it's the next day. The primer has dried and now it's time to sand. And you can see I am sped up in this video, but you can see how quickly I go over my sanding. This is a light scuff sand with a fine grit sanding sponge, usually about 180 to 220. And I'm just knocking down that surface giving it a nice smooth finish so that we can start building that really smooth finish when it's time to spray the top coat. Now that the sanding is done, I've gone and I vacuumed, which there was no footage of, but that's okay, you get the picture. Now I go back in and I caulk all of the gaps and cracks. They're all gonna show really bad if you don't caulk them. They're gonna show as a contrasting shadow to the white, which looks really bad. Hopefully this seam here will show really good. Just kind of shoot that in there and then I try to push it in with my finger and then go back with a damp rag and wipe it off till it's nice and smooth. And then once I paint over that, that's gonna hopefully really disappear into the wood. I like to use a dripless smooth rod caulk gun so that as I'm pulling the trigger, it's smooth and it doesn't jump at all. I use a 12 to one ratio. Your standard metal caulk guns are four to one and they're, they're gonna be a hot mess. So this just allows you to have better control. Now the caulking is done. I am sanding all of the doors. They were actually sitting out in the client's garage. I was lucky where my client had a heated garage and let me leave the doors out there to dry. So that was nice. It allowed me to just have a better setup than I normally get to do and uh, keep them all on site. Again, I just go over them with a fine grit sanding sponge, give them a light sand, and then go and vacuum all the dust off. I do not use tack cloths. Tack cloths can leave residue behind and create problems. I find that just vacuuming them off thoroughly is more than enough so that I have a dust-free environment for spraying my top coat. This is also a good time to look everything over and find any imperfections in the doors. Did you miss anything? It may not show through when the doors are oak, but now is when you can see, should I be caulking something? Did I miss a corner that was gouged up? Did I not 
do grain filler good somewhere. In between every coat, you should be looking for that stuff. But after the primer is really the best time because ideally you're not fixing too much after your first top coat before your second because you want to get some buildup over these things. And if you have to really sand things down, you can have a lot of work in between your first and second coat. So you might have to reprime. You might have to add an extra coat. I found something on that door there. I don't remember what it is now, but you can see I pointed to it, set it aside to go back and fix later. My guess is that these couple little drawer fronts had some bleed through or, or they weren't dry enough. That could be the case too. Next, I'm mixing up my emerald urethane top coat with 20% water, just how I mixed up my primer. I'm thinning it down so that it will atomize nicely out of my HVLP sprayer and lay down with a real nice glassy coat on these cabinets when I start spraying the top coat. If you don't thin it down, you're not gonna get good atomization with your HVLP or even airless sprayer, and the paint isn't gonna lay down on the cabinet doors quite as nicely. So what you end up is getting more of a texture on your doors, like a little bit of orange peel texture rather than a smooth glassy finish texture. Again, I use my angled paint mixer and that keeps it from creating air bubbles in there while pulling all the paint down and mixing everything really well. You can find a link to that paint mixer and all these tools that I use in the description below. So if you're gonna do your cabinets and you wanna grab some of these tools, go ahead and do that. By the way, I appreciate it when you do that. That always helps me out and earn a small commission on them. All right, now that we're finally onto the top coat, we are on the home stretch of this job. This is a part I like really when the cabinets go from looking, you know, white with the primer to really having that finished look. When you're spraying, one thing to remember is go slow and overlap your spray by 50% as you're spraying. And don't be shy because you're spraying flat doors. It isn't gonna run. Put that paint on nice and heavy and allow it to really kind of lay down together and smooth out on its own. If you notice me picking at the tip of the sprayer while I spray, that's actually because the turbine blows out warm air and you can get a little bit of built up dried paint right on the tip of the sprayer. So every three, four, five, ten 10 minutes, whatever, I might stop and kind of flick out any little dried paint that builds up in the tip of the sprayer. Cause that dried paint can make your spray fan a little awkward. It can alter the look of the spray fan and make it uh, just not spray quite as nice, start clogging it up. All right, well watching two rounds of top coat can get a little dull. So let's skip right to the good part. Now I am done spraying. There are two coats of top coat on and I'm packing the Wagner Flexio 5000 back into the case from which it came. Another little neat thing about this is that the entire gun, hose, and everything is all contained in the same case. I will admit, getting it put back in the way it came sometimes feels almost impossible, but I did manage to do it here. And there we go. Handy dandy little thing, and now it's time to start the deep prep and let the kitchen come together. So deep prep day is hopefully fun. As long as you did everything right, it's a fun day. It also can be a miserable day if things didn't go right and you find paint in all sorts of places where it shouldn't be. Thankfully on this job, paint was everywhere it was supposed to be and nowhere it wasn't supposed to be. So my deep prep day actually went quite well. Even when everything goes right, there is always touch up on a cabinet. Maybe a certain cabinet couldn't be prepped properly and you have to go in and touch up some edges, which I had to do on this kitchen. Or maybe, uh, you know, you had a little light spot somewhere. Maybe you had a run you need to sand out or cut out with a razor blade. Stuff like that. It happens and don't get discouraged. That is normal. Even for someone who's been doing it 20 plus years, I, I do touch up and that is a part of every single job I do. And there's really no way around it. So it's reassembly day here, and there's a few areas as I start to pull off all the plastic and everything that I decided to hold off on and brush them because I didn't want to spray around all of this brick. If any paint gets on brick, it doesn't come off. Brick is too porous. So it's a perfect place to bust out our new DIY painting cabinet brush. It's a brush I've been working on for a good six months now, and it's a nylon polyester blend bristles 
And it's, in my opinion, the absolute perfect brush for painting cabinets. So you can actually go and find this on our website, DIYPaintingSupply.com and get your own. This is our first prototype brush and today I get to demo it here for you. So go ahead and use it. So the reason I went with this type of brush and these bristles and everything, um, the nylon polyester blend holds water-based enamels really well. It cleans really well. Uh, the bristles snap back good, so they, they hold their shape good. And we've got a finished handle too, which I like, versus most uh, handles are beech wood and unfinished. So when you get paint on them, they just look terrible, where this tends to resist that a little bit more. And then lastly, we got the one piece for rule, and it just looks clean and nice in my opinion. We threw our, threw our DIY painting right on there so you remember who you're watching and just start painting with it. So with the really soft bristles, the idea behind this is that it leaves fewer brush strokes than your normal stiffer bristle brushes. You're still gonna see brush strokes, especially on the primer. The idea is that it's just gonna lay a little bit softer and a little bit nicer for you than your stiff bristle brushes. I like a stiff bristle brush for cutting in ceilings, but I don't like it for painting cabinets. For cabinets, I like the nice soft bristles. And these are incredibly soft. So first I'm gonna go around, I'm just gonna kinda of cut in this line next to the brick. Then I'm gonna go back and fill it in. And I'm gonna give it that nice, smooth finish. And remember, this is just primer. We don't have to be perfect on our primer and it dries fast. So you don't have a lot of time to work with it. But you can see with these soft bristles already, normally with a stiffer bristle, you're gonna have more of a variation from light to dark. Whoop, didn't mean to touch it there, light to dark. With a softer bristle, you're gonna get a more even coat with less brush strokes. Final brushes are gonna look a little bit different. Like I said, this is our first prototype, so we colored our bristles a little bit different. I did away with the offset handle too. After a while, my wonderful idea of the offset handle just didn't feel right anymore, and traditional handle was the new winner. Underneath cabinets, where people often have lights and stuff installed, is a little bit tricky of a spot to spray, so oftentimes you'll have a little strip where the spray maybe didn't get in. So that's a pretty normal spot to have to do some touch up when you're all said and done. Now that the touch up is all done, it's time to put the hinges and the doors back on. And as long as you labeled all of your doors and kept your hinges in order, this part is a little tedious, but it shouldn't be too hard. This homeowner had actually moved the hinges so there's some extra holes on the back, which I didn't really notice beforehand. So I went back in and filled those and it wasn't a big deal. Turned out really nice. If you didn't label your doors and keep your hinges in order, this step can be miserable and take you literally two to four times longer than it should. So make sure to label your doors so that you don't have regrets about putting your kitchen back together later. And you'll find even if you do everything right, you're still gonna have a few doors going on crooked here and there. So be ready to do a little bit of adjustments. Also, I like to always go in and put on clear bumpers on all my doors, you know, so they don't bang when they close, keeps edges from chipping, and keeps the doors when the paint is fresh from kind of sticking together. Because these enamels, they may be dry overnight and feel good, but they're not fully cured. They typically can take anywhere from like one to four weeks to fully cure and reach their maximum hardness. If you do paint your cabinets, you can put them back together the next day, but treat them nice, be gentle with them for a couple weeks until they reach their maximum hardness. Well, that wraps up this project and hopefully you learned something. Thanks for watching and until next time, good luck on your DIY painting project. <laughs>